the True Crime Page podcast featuring Scott Williams, Carly, Williams, Carly, Williams, Carly, Williams, Carly, Williams, Carly, Williams, Carly. Welcome to the True Crime Page podcast. I'm your host, Scott Williams Collier. Today, guys, we're going to cover the story of the unsolved murder of 14 year old schoolgirl Lisa Jane Hessian from Lee in Greater Manchester. Now, I've been meaning to cover this one for a while now. Lisa's from my hometown in Lee, and at the time of her murder, I lived just around the corner on Henry Street. Now, I was quite young at the time, about a month shy of my seventh birthday, but it's the earliest memory I have of something terrible happening, and it's been with me ever since. I know a lot of people um, in the Lee area have never forgotten about Lisa's murder. Sadly, it has been unsolved now for almost 36 years, so what I'd like to do today, even if it's just a little bit, is just help raise the profile of Lisa's case. Um... I've said this many times before. It's so important that we don't forget about Lisa. Um, It's so important that we keep talking about her case and keep raising awareness and keep having discussions about Lisa's case because I I believe it keeps a little bit of pressure on the police to keep investigating, but more importantly, it could prompt somebody to remember something. It may also give someone the courage to come forward who may have held something back Uh, years ago it might give someone the courage to come forward and say something to the police that they've never said before so it's important like i say that we keep raising awareness and we don't stop talking about lisa's case i do believe that there's somebody out there who knows who this perpetrator is and i do believe that you know eventually he's going to be brought to justice that's my hope anyway Uh, so what i want to do today i want to give you a breakdown of what happened to Lisa and when it happened, discuss a little bit about a few of the other things that happened in that area as well at the time. Um, And like I said, I just want to help raise the profile of Lisa's case. Now, these tragic events all unfolded on Saturday the 8th of December back in 1984. Lisa was given permission by her mum, Christine, to attend a Christmas party on Lee Road. She was given permission to go there on the one condition that she makes sure she's back that evening by 10.30pm. Lisa was at the party with her boyfriend, uh, Craig Newell, who was age 16 at the time, and she stayed at the party till 10.15pm. At 10.15pm, Lisa left. She gave Craig a kiss goodbye at the gate, and she left the house to head back home, as promised, for 10.30pm. Lisa was wearing a three-quarter length navy coat, a white skirt, a striped t-shirt, red jumper and white canvas boots that evening. During a walk home, she walked through the town centre onto St. Ellen's Road before being last seen turning left onto Buck Street, not far from where she lived. Now, at some point, she was accosted. and This was likely, likely to be near Newlands Road at the top of uh, Rugby Road. She was grabbed by the t-shirt which was pulled very tightly around the neck, likely had another hand clamped around her mouth and she was dragged down the back of a ginnel, at the back of the ginnel on Rugby Road. Uh, At some point during that struggle, Lisa unfortunately died and she was left in a ginnel by someone's uh, back gate. Christine Hessian, Lisa's mum, told of a frantic search that that evening for her daughter when she failed to return home. Um, she told Lisa to be back for 10.30pm, otherwise she'd be grounded and she wouldn't be allowed out for a month. Concerned that Lisa had not returned home by 11.45, she decided to leave the house and go and look for her daughter. She disclosed that on three occasions she left the house to go looking for Lisa, and at one point she even rang the hospital. Christine, like I said, first went out at 11.45, 
uh, to look for Lisa. She walked up to Wood's chip shop about half a mile away, then she walked back home again. She phoned uh, Andrew Heaton's house where the party was being held but received no reply. Uh, she then decided to walk back out again over to Lee Bridge on St. Helens Road and then returned home. After going out for a third time and having no luck in tracing Lisa, she decided to call the police. Christine later recalled, I had an inner feeling that something was not right. To think that I must have walked past there at least three times when I was out looking for her, that's what hurts more than anything. Lisa's body was discovered just before midnight that evening by 43-year-old Ron Parry, who was out walking his dog with his 13-year-old son. Lisa was found by the back gate of someone's garden in, in the Ginnell on Rugby Road, where she'd been dragged and left. An inquest heard that Lisa died from pressure to the neck. Um, like I said, it's believed that the killer had grabbed her tightly around the T-shirt and pulled it tight around the neck, had clamped his other hand around the mouth. Um, the verdict of unlawful killing was never in doubt, but the coroner did say that he may not have intended to kill Lisa. Luckily, a partial DNA uh, sample was recovered from Lisa's body. Now, interestingly, this was not the only sexually motivated attack that happened in Lee in that time period. In the months leading up to Lisa's murder, there had been three other attacks on young girls in the very same area by someone who was described as being baby-faced at around 18 to 20 years old. In August of 1984... Carol Gallagher, age 20, a medical records officer, was returning home at 2am to her home on Rugby Road. She was attacked just 30 yards from where Lisa would be killed. A man aged 18 to 20 years old, wearing a red hat and a blue tracksuit, put his hand around her mouth on Rugby Road. He dragged her down to the ground and he threatened to kill her. Carol talked her way out of trouble and eventually walked with the man for 300 yards. She later told Manchester Evening News, I started to talk to him about anything I could think of. Uh, he said he was having trouble finding a girlfriend, and after we chatted, the man said he was sorry. Then we parted ways. On Sunday, September the 2nd, in the early hours, a 17-year-old girl was walking along Central Avenue in Lee. A man exposed himself and then seized her from behind. He said to her, if you make a noise, I will kill you and he tried to push her down to the ground, but she managed to escape. On December the 7th, this is 24 hours before Lisa was murdered, a man in a white shirt and grey trousers exposed himself to a 16-year-old girl on spare land off Mather Lane in Lee. He struck the girl and said, if you scream, I will break your neck. The victim managed to knee him in the groin and run off. Three days after the murder of Lisa, Detective Superintendent Terry Millard who at the time was leading the investigation, said, There is a distinct possibility that the three attacks, by virtue of style in which they were carried out, and the things that were said could have been committed by the same person. Police later issued a, an old-style photo fit of a baby-faced man suspected of the sex attacks and wanted in connection with Lisa's murder. Now, journalist Neil Keeling has been the lead journalist on Lisa's story right from the beginning. He wrote on, uh, he first started writing on Lisa's case when he worked for the Bolton Evening News back in 1984. He now works for the Manchester Evening News and he's still covering Lisa's story today. Back, in, back on the 28th of November in 2017, Neil wrote that in May 1985, Five months after Lisa Hessian's murder, there was another attack on Buck Street, which was less than 200 yards away from where Lisa was murdered. Neil wrote, A woman was attacked close to the Ginnell behind Rugby Road, where Lisa's body was found. The daughter of the 1985 victim said, After my mother was attacked, the serious crime squad came as they connected it to previous attacks. It was 9.40pm and she was on Buck Street. She felt someone run up behind her. The man grabbed her and bashed her into the house wall near the junction on St. Helens Road. He had a fight with her and then was undoing his trousers while my mum lay on the floor. When a neighbour drove into the road with her headlights on, he ran off into St. Helens Road. He was later seen doubling back onto the estate. The side of my mum's face was a mess. 
She was very badly bruised. Her face was black and blue from where he'd thrown her against the wall. I feel it is someone local who was responsible for the attacks. It had a deep effect on my mother. The police said that my mum's build was like a little doll and the attacker must have mistaken her for a young girl. Now, while the four other attacks that took place, the three before Lisa's murder and the one five months later, have never been forensically linked, I think there's too much of a coincidence there for me. They all fit the same MO perfectly. They were all sexually motivated attacks against young girls and they were all carried out within yards of each other. Um, You had two attacks on Rugby Road, another one less than 200 yards away on Buck Street, another one on Mather Lane, which is just a quick walk around the corner, a couple of minutes walk, and another one that was less than two miles away at Central Avenue. Uh, Very similar things were said as well. Uh, in the interaction with the perpetrator, threats to kill, grabbing them around the mouth, pulling them down to the ground. Um, And the victim type was the same. And they were all committed in a very... um, They were all committed in the the same area. So there's too much of a coincidence there for me. I really do believe this is the same person. And I also believe that he is responsible for Lisa's murder. You know, I, I do believe that this person is local as well because the the areas where the attacks took place, Rugby Road, Buck Street, Central Avenue, Mather Lane, these are all very densely populated areas that are filled with terraced houses that are all facing each other. Um, it's a warren of long streets and ginnels which could quite easily be confusing to somebody who isn't from the area. Uh, to be able to commit crimes of that nature you would have to feel confident and comfortable in your surroundings. So I've always believed that the perpetrator is local. The day after Lisa's murder, all the houses on Bonniewell Road where she lived had their curtains closed as a mark of respect. Lee really is a very close-knit community. It's one of those places where everyone knows each other. Um, I know that there's many in the town that believe someone knows who the killer is and... That is um, an opinion that I share myself as well. I do think about it quite a lot, and I find it very hard to believe that there's not somebody out there who, at the very least, has a suspicion who killed Lisa. I mean, if you look at the attack on 20-year-old Carol Gallagher, for instance, back in August of 1984, this was just yards away from where Lisa was murdered, and she described her attacker as being 18 to 20 years old, baby-faced, and he was wearing a blue tracksuit and a red cap. Now, that's quite distinctive clothing, and it leads me to believe that there is somebody out there who knows something, or at the very least has a, su- a suspicion, but has remained quiet. You know, it may be parents, a sibling, um, close relative, or a close friend, but I do believe that there's somebody out there who knows something, and they've likely remained quiet out of loyalty or fear. I think you've also got to look at the possibility that sometimes people might have a suspicion about something, and then they talk themselves out of it and decide not to say something. You know, the sad thing is, this crime's remained unsolved for almost 36 years now, and sadly, Lisa's mum, Christine Hessian, passed away in 2016 without ever finding out who murdered her daughter and she never got to see any justice for Lisa. And the thing is, this is a solvable case. Not only do I believe that there's somebody out there who who knows or has a suspicion who committed this crime, we also have a partial DNA sample left at the scene. We do have um, a photo fit, um, and we do have some witnesses out there who were likely attacked by the same person. And um, recently, Greater Manchester Police also offered uh, a £50,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of Lisa's killer. Um, I do believe that the perpetrator's been very, very lucky up until now. I really do. But I do believe that luck is going to run out for him eventually. The main thing here, like I've said before, is that we don't forget about Lisa's case and we keep raising awareness and keep talking about it as much as possible. Now... Before we end today, I just wanted to first of all give Ryan Daly and one of Lisa's friends, Andrea Ashcroft Aldred, a mention. 
Um, they run the Let's Get Justice for Lisa Jane Hessian and her mum, Christine, Facebook group. Um, they set that up to raise aw awareness of Lisa's case. Like I said, it's so important that we keep raising awareness and don't stop talking about um, Lisa's murder with the hope of, you know, eventually we'll find out who the killer is and bring him to justice and get justice for Lisa and her family. So if you're from Lee or if you knew Lisa and her family or even if you are just interested in the subject and you'd like to help out by sharing information and helping to raise awareness, um, by all means, go and join that group. You can send a request and join the Facebook group. What I'll do when the video's up on YouTube later, uh, have a look in the information below the video. I'll put a link for the group in there. Please go and join it. Um, you know, you're welcome in there. If you if you genuinely want to um, help out, help share awareness about the case and share news articles and things of that nature, it's greatly appreciated. I'd also like to give uh, Neil Keeling another mention. Um, like I said, Neil's been the leading, leading journalist uh, covering Lisa's case right from the beginning back in 1984 when he was at Bolton Evening News. Um, like I said, he works for Manchester Evening News now and he's still covering this, the case today. Um, I did speak to Neil briefly on Facebook a few weeks ago and he mentioned that he, he's also working on the podcast and Lisa's case um, with uh, Ryan Daly. So once that's up, I'm going to put that up on and share it on my page on Facebook. I'm also going to, if you check the information again on the YouTube video, once it's up on YouTube, I'm going to put some of Neil's links for his articles that he's done for Manchester Evening News on there. So please give them a read, uh, share them. It's uh, it's a big help and it's greatly appreciated. Um, last of all, I just wanted to make a request. I have requested this on Ryan's group um, on Facebook, actually, but I'm going to request it on here as well. Um, on the 15th of December in 1984, Detective Rita Kraft took part in a reconstruction of Lisa's final walk home on that fateful evening. She wore similar clothing and followed the route Lisa uh, last walked in a bid to find new witnesses. Now, if there's any listeners listening to this podcast today, if, if you know someone or you were at the reconstruction and you filmed it, or if you know someone who's filmed it, please get in touch with me because I would love a copy of that. Um, I think, again, it's, a, it's another great way if we could get a copy of it if we could get it online and get it shared on social media, um, it would it would be a good way of um, refreshing everyone's memory and uh, again helping to raise awareness of uh, of Lisa's case. So, if you or if you know somebody who was at that reconstruction and you filmed it, maybe you got pictures of it or anything like that, any information at all, please get in touch with me. You can get in touch with me on my Facebook page. Uh, at the True Crime Page podcast, I'm also on Twitter, or you can uh, you can put a message on the YouTube video as well, and I'll get back to you. Right, that's the end of today's podcast. Today, I hope you enjoyed it. As always, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Doesn't cost anything to subscribe to the channel; it's free, and it'll keep you up to date with my latest podcasts. The next podcast will be covering the Bordy Barnes murders, so stay tuned for that. But for now, have a great week ahead, be good to one another, and until next time, I'll see you soon. <laughs>